Hey guys, welcome to join our live sharing talk. Today, we will be demonstrating our engine, Quark. It is an obfuscation neglect Android malware scoring system. And if you have any question, please feel free to ask in Discord. Thank you. So, my name is Kun Yu Chen. I'm a security researcher and the founder of Quark Engine. And we also have another speaker, Jun Wei Song. He's the co-founder of Quark Engine, and he gave talks in security conferences like HIDB and DEF CON. So uh, this is the outline. Number one, we will introduce our malware scoring system. And number two, we will show you how we designed the Delvic Bico loader. And number three, we will go through two cases of real malware analysis using Quark Engine. And number four, we will share our strategy of generating the detection rules. And the last thing, yes, the future works because uh, we still have a lot of things to do. All right, so let's introduce the malware scoring system. As we know, when developing a malware analysis engine, it is important to have a scoring system. However, those systems are either business secrets or too complicated. Therefore, we decided to create a simple but solid one and take that as a challenge. And since we decide, uh, and since we wanted to design a novel scoring system, we stop reading and decoding what other people do in the field of cybersecurity because we don't want our ideas to be subjected to the existing systems. So we started to find ideas in the field other than cybersecurity. And luckily, we found one. Yes, the best practice we found is the criminal law. So, when sentenced a penalty for a criminal, the judge weights the penalties based on the criminal law. And after decoding the law, we find principles behind it. And we developed a scoring system for Android malware. There are only eight principles decoded from the criminal law. And I'll go through it in the following slide. Now let's see uh, principle number one. A malware crime consists of action and targets. In a criminal law, the definition of a crime consists of action and targets. For example, steal money and kill people. So with this principle in mind, we developed the definition of a crime for Android malware. And the definition is the malware crime consists of the same action and targets. For example, steal photos or steal your banking account password. Now, let's see principle number two. We consider that the loss of fame is greater than the loss of wealth. In a criminal law, 
physical body injury is more serious than psychological injury. So the principle we decoded here is when things are hard to recover, we consider it a felony. So with this principle in mind, we developed our second principle. We consider the loss of fame is greater than the loss of wealth because it's easier to make the money back than rebuild your reputation. Okay, now let's see principle number three, arithmetic sequence. In a criminal law, when a murderer is sentenced 20 years in prison, and a robber is sentenced seven years in prison for his crime, have you ever think about why 20 and seven years? Why the number? We found no obvious principle in a criminal law. So, we use arithmetic sequence to weight the penalty of each crime. For example, the penalty of white one, which is still banking account password, the penalty weight is 10, and Y2, which is still photos, the penalty weight is 20, and Y3, 30, etc. So, now let's see the most important part of the scoring system. We create an author theory. And the author theory consists of three principles. There are principle number four, five, and number six. So let's first look at principle number four. The later the stage, the more we are sure that the crime is practiced. So, as mentioned in Chapter 4 of Taiwan Criminal Law, each crime consists of a sequence of behaviors. And those behaviors can be categorized in a specific order. Well, let's take murder, for example. Determined in stage one, determined. It means somebody decide to kill someone. And in stage two, conspiracy. It means he or she started to make a plan for the murder. And in stage three, preparation. It means buying stops, for example, buying weapons, or arranging services for the murder plane. And in stage four, start. It means when things are all set, the murderer takes action and is on the way to kill someone. The last stage, stage five. Practice. It means the murderer does pull the trigger and shoot someone. So, as we can see here, the later the stage, the more we are sure that the crime is practiced. So, with this principle in mind, we developed Android malware crime author theory. And in this theory, we also have five stages for the crime. For example, if a malware tries to send out your location data by using SMS, in stage one, we will check if related permission is requested by the malware. And then, we will check if the key if the key native API is called. 
and in stage three, we will see if certain combination of API exist, and then we will check if the APIs are called in a specific order. The last stage, finally, we check if the APIs are handling the same register. Okay, so now you can see from this picture. This is a two-dimensional map for Android malware crime. For the crimes, we put them in white axis. And for each crime, we use X axis to see the evidence we call for this crime. So, X5, white one, it means in crime number one, we have found native APIs that are called in the correct sequence and are handling the same register. And X3, Y5 means in crime number five, we have found certain combination of native APIs that are used in this APK. So now, let's look at principle number five. The more evidence we caught, the more penalty weight we give. So we give stage two more weight than stage one. And stage three more weight than stage two, etc. Okay, principle number six, proportional sequence. As we decode it from the criminal law, the later the stage, the more we are sure that the crime is practiced. So we consider proportional sequence. For example, uh, two to the power of n to present such principle in our scoring system. All right, principle number seven. Crimes are independent events. For simplicity, we assume crimes are independent events. And penalty weight can be added up directly. So, this is an example of adding up two crimes. In the malware, we find two crimes. There are stealing photos and stealing your banking account password. So the calculation of the total penalty weight is quite simple. For each crime, we use penalty weight of crime to multiply the proportion of caught evidence and add up the result of the two. The last principle. Principle number eight, threshold generate system. After calculating the total penalty weight for the malware, we need to have threat level threshold so that we can tell which threat level does the, does the malware fit in. Unfortunately, we can't find them in a criminal law. But we know we need to design a threshold generate system for dots, not just give any number by intuition. So we decide that threat threshold for each threat level is the sum of the same proportion of caught evidence multiplies penalty weight of crimes. We know it's not a perfect one, but we're sure that we build a uh, foundation for future optimization. All right, now let's talk about the design logic of 
Delvic Bico Lover, and my partner Junwei. He will take care of this part. Hello, everyone. My name is Junwei, and I will take care of this part. So now, let's talk about the design logic of Delphi Bico Loader. So our Delphi Bico Loader is actually the implementation of the Android malware cry order theory. We implement every stage of the theory. There are five stages. The first three stages are easy. We simply use APIs in another open source tool, Android Guard, to implement the first three stages. As I just mentioned, the implementation of the first three stages are easy, but in stage four, we need to do a little bit more. So. Before the implementation, we need to know what does stage four do. In stage four, we find the calling sequence of native APIs and check if they are called in a specific order. For example, if a malware sends out your location data. By SNS. Then first, it will call native API get cell location to get your location data, and then it will call native API send text message to send your location data by SNS. Normally. Native APIs are wrapped in functions, so we trace back to see which function is cross-referenced from the native APIs, and we call those functions the parent function, and we will keep tracing back until we find the mutual parent function for both. The native APIs. Here is the example. Send text message is called by send SNS, which is the parent function of send text message. And get cell location is called by get location, which is the parent function. Of get cell location, and if we keep tracing back, we will see that both send SNS and get location shares the same parent function, which is send message. And after we find the mutual parent function, we will scan through a spotly light code. Of the mutual parent function, and check which function is called first. So this is the smallly like code of send message. We can see that get location is called first to get location data of the cell phone, and the send SNS is called. To send out the location data, and in stage four, we found out that our design can also overcome the obfuscation techniques used by the malware. When applying obfuscation techniques, function except native APIs are renamed. This has made the decompiled source code hard to read for human. 
the machines can still run the code because the logic of the core remains the same. Here is the example. When applying obfuscation techniques, native API send text message is called by function k, and function k is called by function f. The other native API get cell location is called by function e, and both function e and f. Shares the same parent function, which is a. So you see, if you start reading the decompiled source code of a, it will be hard to figure out what is going on there. And by the way, since our goal is to find the mutual parent function. So it doesn't matter how many layers the wrappers are. Now, let's see the implementation of stage five. Yes, this is the most important part. In stage five, we need to confirm that if the native APIs are handling the same register. Let's use the same example. Send out your location data by using SNS. So when native API get cell location is called, it will return the location data of the cell phone. And what we do in stage five is to check if the order. Uh, if the other native API send text message, sends out the location data return from get cell location. So in stage five, we simulate the CPU operation, and we will read line by line of the smallly like source code. And operate like CPU to get two things. First, the value of every register. Second, the information like functions who have operated the same register. To make this happen, we create a self-defined data type. We call its register object. In each register object, we store three kinds of the information. Number one, the register name, and number two, the value of the register, and number three, the function who use this register. Let's see the example. So the register name is v seven, and the value of the register is a string. And the string appends the value of string one, and the result of function one. And then we can see that the register. Is used as the input source of the function two. And by the way, when filling in the value of use by which function in the register object, we expand every register by cross-referencing other register object. In the table. So, for example, by cross-referencing, we know that v8 is a string, which is user location, and v3 
is a function called get location. As you can see in the lower right corner, the result of get location is appended to the string, which is user location, and the new string is sent out by using function send sns. In other words, the value of register fee seven is generated by using function get location, which has native API one in it, and the value is used as an input for function send sns. Which has native API two in it. So now we prove that by using the register objects, we can check if the APIs are handling the same register. So after we scan through the source code, we will produce. Lots of registered objects, and those registered objects will be organized when a two-dimensional Python list. It is a similar idea like hash table. We will use it to boost up the read and write. Of the list. So now, let's see the table. As you can see here, register v four has three register objects. That means in the source code we scan, v four was used three times, and every time when it was used. We store the present value of the register, and the function who use it if there is one. So basically, the whole table is the history of the registers. So when we finish constructing this table, which is the hash table we built, we then Scan through all registered objects in the table to check if the native APIs are handling the same register. So now let's see how to use Quark Engine to analyze the malware. And now let's get back to Kun Yu. So, in this section, we prepared two malware. One is non-obfuscated, and the other one is obfuscated. And for each malware, we will show how we detect the behavior of the malware with the detection rule. Now, let's.、Uh, Look at the first malware. This is a non-obfuscated one. We will use the rule in Quark Engine to detect whether if the malware send out cell phones location data by using SMS. So this is the detailed report of Quark Engine. In this report. The engine shows the detection results of one single malware behavior, or you can say one single malware crime. So, for example, we try to find if the malware sends out your location data by using SMS. 
So in this report, we list out the evidence we found in each stage of the Android malware crime order theory, and this report shows we find evidence in every stage. Which means we have a hundred percent of confidence that the malware has this behavior. So let's see. In stage one, permissions like send SMS, access course location, and find location are requested. And in the second stage. Key native APIs like get cell location and send text message are used. And in stage three, we found certain combination of native API exist. And in stage four, we found out that in functions like send message and do byte. The APIs are called in the right sequence, and in stage five, in function send message, we found out that those APIs are handling the same register. So now let's think: if you're analyzing this malware and you want to trace. The decompiled source code to see the evidence. How do you do it? Our suggestion is, if you are reading this detailed report generated by Quark Engine, you start reading backwards. That means you start from stage five. So. For example, in stage five, we know that inside the function of send message, it has two functions that contains the two native APIs respectively, and they're handling the same register. So you start to locate function send message. And the decompiled source code. And in stage four, we know that those two functions are called in the right sequence. So we can start to find functions that contains the native APIs and check if they are really called in the right sequence. And the information of the、um, two functions. And the sequence will be shown in the next version of Quark Engine. So now let's look at a real example. As we just mentioned in a detailed report, we need to locate the function of send message, and we found out that two functions that contains The two native APIs, respectively. There are send SMS and get location. And if we dive into the function, dive into the source code of this function, get location, we will see that it contains native API get cell location. And if we dive into the source code of function send SMS, we will see that it contains native API send text message. So, the decompiled source code here it means the APK or the malware will first collect your cell phone location data. And send it out through SMS. So now let's dive into the source code of function get location. As you can see in the source code, 
it tries to call native ADI get cell location and return this information at the end of the code. And now let's dive into the source code of send SMS. Native API send text message is used to send out of, to send out the location info. Well, it's quite simple, isn't it? And now let's look at the uh, second malware. This is an obfuscated one. We will use the rule in Quark Engine to find whether if the malware detect Wi-Fi hotspot by gathering information like active network info and cell phone location. Okay, so as a malware analyst, we read the report backwards. So as you can see, in stage five, there are functions like p.a at view.c and af.run. And those functions, they, has, they have two functions that contains the native APIs respectively, and they're handling the same register. And in stage four, these two functions are also called in the right sequence in functions like p.a, at view.c, and af.run. So, according to this report, we can say that the malware has the behavior of Wi-Fi hotspot detection in three parts of the source code. We can pick any part for further analysis. So we just pick function p.a. So now let's see the source code. Let's locate the function p.a. And, and we found out that two functions that contains the two native APIs respectively. There are ap.a and f.f. And if we dive into the function of ap.a, we will see that it contains native API get active network info. And if we dive into the function of f.f, we will see that it contains native API get cell location. So the code here means after collecting information from function ap.a and f.f, they send the information as an input for function am.a. So now let's dive into the source code of function ap.a. As you can see in the source code, it tries to call native API get active network info and return the related information at some point. And now let's dive into the source code of f.f. Native API get cell location is used to get the cell phone location data. And this information is processed with some other strings. And at the end of this function, it returns the strings with the information. As I mentioned earlier, after collecting information from a function ap.a and f.f, they use the information as an input for function am.a. 
and we noticed one thing that function am.a use byte array output string as one of its input parameter and we know when seeing byte array output string it means the function is probably trying to write the data into a file well this is amazing isn't it so with quark engine malware analysis can really boost up their productivity okay so now i will introduce our detection rule generate strategy so why do we need to develop the detection rules generate strategy the reason is quite simple because to make our engine practical and easy to use for malware analysis we need to have more detection rules however the speed of rule generated by human is quite slow and a human generated rule is subjected to his or her experiences of malware analysis so we decide to develop a rule generate strategy to boost up the production of detection rules since our goal is to find all kinds of behaviors in the malware so if we use permissions and native apis to generate all possible rules we will have an amazing amount of rules which is a uh, 1.26252e plus 13 amazing amazing number so and after if we if we really take time and a disk volume to generate such amounts of rules we then use quark engine to find the intersection between those amazing amounts of rules and the malware we prepared we prepare a lot of malwares so in other words we find rules that matched the malware behaviors however this is not a good way to generate detection rules because it's very obvious it's time and resource consuming so we developed a seven step rule generate strategy in step one we crawl down all native API information on Android official API reference for example this is the native API information of send text message you can see the input parameter the return value and the description of this API we call we pro all of them down into our computers okay step two so we did a little bit modification to our engine we ignored the permission checks in stage one of the Android malware crime order theory and in step three we find all kinds of API combination and generate rules without permission information and stage four we use the modified quark engine to find the intersection of the rules and the malware we call rules in the intersection this part the first stage verified rules in other words these rules 
there st they still need to be verified again. And since we don't need to generate rules with permissions, and we don't need to verify and verify the permission in Quark Engine, the whole process of rule production really speeds up. And in stage five, we try to generate rules with permissions. So inside this intersection, we have first stage verify rules matched with malwares. We then use the first stage rule and the permission in the, mail, in the matched malware to generate rules with permission, which is the uh, second stage rule. And in step six, we then use uh, the Quark engine, the, uh, full ver the full function version, to find again the intersection of the second stage rule which has the uh, permission information in and the malwares we prepare. We find the intersection of those two. After that, for each rule, we label the number of matched malware. So, as you can see, uh, uh, the rule number one uh, it can be found. The behavior of rule number one can be found in a hundred malware. And the behavior of uh, rule number three uh, the, can be found in 80 malware, etc. We label such information in somewhere. And in step seven, after labeling the rules, we then sort the rules by numbers of matched malware. And we will review the rules from the highest match one. That's our strategy for the production of rules. All right, the last part, future works. As I mentioned earlier, we still have lots of things to do. For example, we need to have more detection rules. And we also need to deal with the .so files and the packed APKs. And we want to have more features of the Delvic Bytecode Loader. For example, uh, we want to uh, we want to f we want to have uh, features like uh, the downloader, and we also want to apply the scoring system to other binary formats. Yes, it is in our to the list. And also, we noticed one thing. We noticed that the API changes in different version of Android. And every year it has a different version, it has a newer version. So we will also take care of this problem in the next version of Quark. And the last thing, we probably would change the core library since Android God is quite inactive recently. And there is one nugget that I would like to share. We work at the limits of our tools. When new tools come along, new things are possible. Okay, that's all for today. And if you have any question, please feel free to ask in Discord. Thank you.